Good morning, church. Good morning. We're glad to be here with you today as we're going through our Rooted series. Uh, we have Luke Borton bringing us a message today. So excited for you to hear that. But before we jump into that, we want to invite you to stand up and worship with us. We clap our hands. Come on. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day. Let your kingdom come, Father. Let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come, Father. Let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours. It's yours. I'm sorry when I 
Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb who was slain. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you are 
the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that you rose with all power and authority in your hands. We praise your name, Jesus, both today and forevermore. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Well, if you caught this week's midweek message, you'll know that Luke and Danny are excited about the upcoming NBA basketball season. If, well, you, you all live in central Ohio in October, so you Many of you are probably invested in some way, shape, or form in football right now, too. Whether it's high school on Fridays, or Buckeyes on Saturdays, or NFL on Sundays. Now, my wife and kids will tell you that I partake in plenty of both of those sports. But it, when it comes to October, there's one pastime that beats all of them. Playoff baseball. There's something about that sport and about the, the theater of baseball during the playoffs that is just, it, it's a different level for me. Uh, just, just love it. There, there's, this, there's this thing in, in baseball specifically that I think about with the batter versus the pitcher. It's this intense matchup of pressure that you get in only this sport. And when it comes to playoff time, you see that pressure amplified in such a way you can feel it through the television. Now, it, it reminds me of something that I used to teach when I used to coach baseball. We used to teach our kids that when they got into those pressure situations, if they started to feel it, whether there were runners on base or it was a late game situation, there was one practice we'd teach them to try to get them to kind of take a second and relieve some of that pressure, clear their heads. You take a step out of the box, you take a deep breath, and then you'd repeat either a word or a short phrase that would kind of help you to clear your mind. That phrase might be just a little confidence booster. It might be something to remind you of the mechanics that you worked on throughout the week, kind of just to get you back into that state. Or it might be something that you wanted to focus on for that next pitch. But whatever it was, the intention was just to clear the pressure, clear the thought that was thoughts that were starting to muddle in your brain so that you could focus in on what the next task was. I wonder if some ways for us in the hustle and the pressure that we feel in our lives, if communion can kind of be that opportunity for us. It's a chance for us to take a step out, take a deep breath, and be reminded of some of the things that we need to really be focusing on. Maybe it's a chance to refocus. Maybe it's an opportunity to release some of the mistakes of the past week through confession. An opportunity to remind ourselves of our fundamentals as Christians, loving God and loving other people an opportunity for us to restore our confidence in the one who sacrificed himself for us. So as we come to communion today uh, and take the opportunity to remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if you're starting to feel some of that pressure in your life, I would encourage you to take a few moments today, block out all the other thoughts, take a deep breath, and remember what we're here for. Remind yourself that none of that pressure can ever overtake you when you're rooted in his love. Maybe even use these words from Psalm 46 to remind us and remind you who our God is and renew our, your focus. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, this morning at this time of communion, and we, we just sit in awe. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you came and gave the ultimate gift on our behalf. And I pray that as we come to you this morning, that in the midst of whatever we're feeling, whatever pressures from this world, whatever hustle from this world we're feeling, that you would remind us that there's nothing that can overtake us, that you are here, that you are with us. And I pray that you'd also remind us of the sacrifice that you gave so that we could be with you.
I love sharing uh, good news. And in light of the fact that we just came out of communion, you know, the greatest good news ever is the fact that Jesus died on the cross, which means every single one of our sins are forgiven. Uh, but there's even more, more good news. I'd like you to meet this family. So there's this couple um, here at our church. So it's, uh, it's Merrill and Hatsuko Snyder. And, uh, and that photo is like larger than life, would you not say? So how awesome is this? This couple, they are amazing people. They love Jesus with all their heart. They want to serve Jesus. And the fact of the matter is, is that they'd like to belong to our church family. Now, I don't even know if they're in the, the audience right now, but by your applause, would you welcome Merrill and Hatsuko to our church family? We are absolutely delighted delighted that you would want to be a part of that. And I pray that for anyone here, if you've not yet maybe joined our church family, we'd love to have you be a part of that because of your faith and trust in Jesus. Let me also share this too. So we want to help Warm share some good news as well. So Warm, again, is near and dear to our hearts. That's the Westward Area Resource Ministry. So this is what's happening for them. They're trying to put together Thanksgiving blessing baskets, and they cannot do that without getting certain products to put in the baskets. So what we'd like to do for the rest of October is that we'd like to collect warm drinks for warm, okay? So those drinks would be coffee, tea, or hot chocolate. So it's 10 to 12 ounce canisters of coffee, 10 to 12 ounce canisters of, of hot chocolate, maybe a bag of tea bags, whatever it is. If you bring all of those supplies in, you bring them in, we'll collect them all together, we'll get them to warm, and then warm will distribute them out to, to people, offering up some good news for some folks that are really hurting they would be deeply encouraged, and I cannot thank you enough for the level of generosity that our church has. Thank you constantly for giving. And now, now we get to continue the Rooted series. Morning. Morning. How you guys doing? Hey, it's fall, y'all. Is everybody, did everybody put on their like fall outfit that's been waiting for them now that it finally like dropped below 60 degrees? It was like 85 for a while, and you were just stubbornly wearing hoodies. And we made it. We're good. Um, we are continuing in the Rooted series, and actually, what we're starting is a, a two-parter. Um, the next two weeks are basically the same thing, but in different angles and with like. It'll make sense as we go, but really, here's the two questions. Um, does your life have a purpose? Does your life have a purpose, and if so, what is it? Do I have a purpose? What is my purpose? These two questions are going to dominate your life. They're going to dominate your uh, decision-making from here until the end. And the way you ask that question and the way that you try to answer that question is probably different for every person in your row, Right? And so a couple of you guys are thinking about this and you think about it as a way to talk about people. That like the purpose of your life involves people, relationships, marriages, kids, things like that. And so the way that you will try to answer that question is with those, those people. Some of you think about this as work. What's my job? What will I retire doing? Who do I work with? What is my influence? What college will I attend? Where will I move to? Where will my job take me? And some people, it's like an influence or a power thing. It's like throwing a stone in a lake with your life and seeing, like, how far can I get this to ripple, right? How, how are people going to talk about me afterwards? And my wife and I, we have a privilege of working with high school kids, and it is a privilege. They're very cool. And um, one of the things that's very interesting about high school kids is we ask them this deliberately. Now, we don't say, what's the purpose of your life? 
that's kind of confrontational. We, we say it different ways. We're like, what are you going to do after high school? What, what do you want to be? Where are you going to go? Have you thought about that yet? When you get to be an adult, we're like, we're not interested anymore. But when you're a kid, people are like, what do you want to do? And it's so interesting. My wife is um, a counselor. She's a social worker in a school. And one of the things that's so interesting because it happens every year is that there will be multiple kids in her office talking to her. And when you look at, like, the cards they've been dealt, nailing it. Like, there's not a bad pick in the batch as far as what to do afterwards. It's, we're talking, like, full rides, scholarships, pristine. There's a kid that's sitting in there, and he's like, well, I mean, the Ivy Leagues are kind of far. I could maybe case Westerns. The, I don't know. And if you're sitting here and you have student loans, you're looking at this and you're going, stop, stop. You won. You won. You beat high school. Like, you won the game. You're good. You're, you're at 18 and you won. You're fine. But they're discovering maybe what you've discovered. You can climb the mountain. You can win the fight. You can do all those things. And then that question still lingers. What's my purpose? Because this didn't, this didn't take that question away. And you will feel that if you've tried to answer it with people. You will have kids or get married or that relationship will mend and you'll still kind of be sitting there like, uh, I still have this feeling. Amen. It could be a work thing. You could have this um, promotion. You could get to that place. You could, you could get that new job so that your old boss finally has to grovel because you're, do, you know, whatever it is, like, ah, that feeling's still there. So here's the good news. The Bible tells us that your life has a purpose. You have a special purpose. God has given you that purpose. And so here's kind of what we want to talk about. This week, we're going to talk big picture what that purpose is, according to the Bible. Next week, we're going to get a little more specific into how do you step into that. But this week, here's what we're going to do. I have three pairs. So if you're like a note taker, you might even like make three circles, like a big one, a small one, and a small one. Because what we're going to do is like old school CSI, like zoom, enhance, zoom, enhance. Like, you know, we're going to start at like Google Maps, see the whole world, and we're going to zoom into your backyard as we go. But we're going to start with this. We're going to start with a pair of commitments from scripture. We're going to start a pair of teachings from Jesus. And then we're going to do a pair of prayers if you're weary or unsure of anything we just talked about. Okay. So let's spend some time on this first one, okay? Big picture, there are two commitments I think are really important in the Bible if you want to understand what your life's purpose is. The first is with Abraham. In the book of Genesis, God makes a promise to Abraham. He makes a covenant. The closest, like, version of a covenant that we have is marriage. And even that is, like, a little short of what a covenant is. It's not just a contract. It's an oath. And so think about this. God makes an oath with something he created. God who is outside of time looks at someone who has a beginning and an end and he binds himself to him. And this is what this is. It's in Genesis 12, verses 2 through 3. It says, I will bless you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. I will be a You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And so God is explaining how he is going to take care of the entire world by taking care of this one family. That Abraham, with your family, my love is going to overflow so much the entire world will be blessed. And this is what this looks like, because bless is kind of an ambiguous word. We bless you when you sneeze. So what are we talking about here, God? God says, I will be with you. People will know you because you will know the living God. I will protect you. I will bless your land. It will flourish. If you obey my commandments, you will prosper. I will go ahead of you in battle. I will protect you from war. And why is he doing this? So that with the way that you live, the rest of the world will know God. And God puts himself under oath to Abraham with this. 
I will bless you, you will bless the world. Now, eventually, this family becomes the Old Testament nation of Israel. And the Old Testament is basically a story of God doing everything he can to uphold his part of the oath with a people who become increasingly disinterested, unfaithful, or rebellious. Yet Jesus is the culmination of this promise, that from this family comes a blessing, Jesus Christ, who goes to the cross, is crucified, and because he resurrects, we too can walk in his resurrection. That from one family, the whole world is blessed, shame is conquered, and death is optional. So why do we have the Old Testament? I mean, you you think that, right? Like, anyone else, like, not another prequel. Like, that's kind of how the Old Testament can feel. It's like Jesus' prequel story, right? Like, you don't really need it. But here's the thing. It's not simply a contract no longer binding. We're good. Abraham, check. Check. Put that in the done column. Nice. It's not. These promises still stand. In the book of Romans, Paul is actually explaining this to the church in Rome. And no one knows their Old Testament quite like this guy. And he's trying to explain to them, like, okay, well, what do we do with all that, like, stuff Israel was doing? Here's how he explains it. It's in Romans 11. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, have been broken off. And you Gentiles, you people who are not of Abraham's family, who are branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. And so now you receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. I don't know if we have any arborist. Uh, in the audience, but this is a basic thing that we don't do a lot anymore, but you can take a branch off of one tree and you can like tie it, bind it, nail it, and it will fuse to another tree. This is how we get like different fruits and peaches. Peaches is you took a pear tree and stone fruit and we get peaches. Now you learned. Look at that up later at Google. But... (laughs) What, what Paul is saying is, you are now a part of this tree that's roots go millennia back to a conversation between Abraham and God. That the conversation God had with Abraham that said, I will bless you so that you can bless the world, you're a part of that now. You don't simply get all your sins forgiven, you get grafted in. You get adopted. You become a part of this. I will bless you, you will bless the world. This tree with branches all over the world, this tree with roots that go centuries back through Moses and David and the prophets and Jesus and the disciples, you're a part of that tree. And so what is my purpose? My purpose is to bless the world because God has blessed me. You join in the very work of Christ. And this is important because when I become a Christian, I do not simply get a Savior, I get a Lord. He is your Lord and Savior. You can't kind of just buffet line pick this. You get both. It's a package deal. If you just need a Savior, why are you still here? Like when we did the construction with the baptistry here, if you just need a Savior, we could put a skylight there and just like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, boom, and beam you up. Like, well, you need to be here anymore, right? I don't think it really works that way. And also, that would be very violent and crazy. You're still here. Because you are meant to be a blessing in the here and the now. You are meant to shape the world. In the work of Christ, we see two things. We see salvation. We see restoration. We see salvation And we see restoration. To restore something means you take it back to its previous state. In Genesis 2, before sin enters the world, God and man walk side by side. There's peace, 
shame is a foreign concept. And when I become a Christian, I step into Jesus' work of restoration where he himself, being God, walks side by side with people. And with God saying that my spirit is in you, then when I'm living out my purpose and I'm walking side by side with coworkers or my kids or whoever, there's a peek into the garden. There's a peek into restoration. And this is really important because if you don't do this, Christianity will be miserable. If you just want a savior, then you don't ask for the goal or the mission. And if you don't want like a goal or a mission or a purpose for your life, there's nothing to walk towards. There's just stuff to avoid. If there's not an achievement to go after that God has given you, there is only a thing you've inherited that you're nervous about losing. And so you will see the Bible not as God's instruction of how to live your purpose, but how not to mess up. And your operation won't be joy when you look at God. It'll be guilt as if you will lose something because you can't imagine there'd be any more he has in store for you. But there is. There's restoration. The Bible is direction. So I have, uh, I have kids, and it's really interesting. I have a two-and-a-half-year-old and a kid that's about to be one. And the way to I, I talk to them is very different. Now, first off, it blows my mind how quickly they recognize your voice. Like, two months in, they're like, who is that? Like, very quickly, they figure that out. Even on, like, speakerphone, which muddles your voice like crazy because it has to bounce off a satellite to go to someone else's phone, my kids are like, is that mom? Like, very early, they figure that out. The way I talk to my kids is very different. You, you have to start with yes and no. You just have to. Now, with... Zoya, my two-year-old, she now can, like, help a bit. My sentences for her are a little different. It's like, hey, can you bring me your water? Would you like to go to your sandbox? Would you put your shoes on for me? Where did your shoes go? What do you say? With the one-year-old, here's the vocabulary. No, 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 (laughs) no. Hey, 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 hey. Or my favorite, Mr. No, Mr. That's just a year and a half apart. So how familiar are you with God's voice? Can you respond when God is like, hey, can you help me with something? Hey, why don't we do this? Hey, have you considered this? Or are we still on, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. hey, 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 hey. Because if you only respond to that, that's... He's going to meet you where you're at. And I think this is why Jesus gets mad at Pharisees so often, because he's got to be like, I made this life an adventure, and you made it minesweeper. Like, why did you do this? And some of us live that way still. And I want to encourage you, it's, it gets better than that. Your purpose is to know Jesus and be blessed by Jesus so that you can restore the world to know Jesus and be blessed by Jesus. You are grafted onto promises and covenants of God. So let's go to Jesus. Let's talk to you about our pair of teachings here. There's two teachings about Jesus that are going to help us figure out what does that look like? Because that's very vague. Again, bless is kind of an ambiguous word for a lot of us. So what does this look like? Well, first off, Jesus has pretty high hopes for you. I don't know if you know that. Uh, in John 14, 12, it says this. Jesus is speaking with his disciples, and he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. Holy smokes, even greater works. Let's go. I mean, do you know, like, what Jesus was doing? We're talking, like, feeding 5,000. We're going to do 10,000, baby. Like, we are going to be doing some good stuff here. Imagine the influence. Jesus did not have a LinkedIn. We're going to be able to network our pants off to get, like, people hooked up with Jesus, okay? The disciples, not really a lot of education. This guy's got his MBA. Let's go, baby. Like, we're going to do this. He never had an iPhone. He never had an iPhone. So, honestly, we're going to influence everybody to Jesus, 
in the most literal sense. Like, we're going to broadcast him into areas that are so remote that was never thought possible. Um, we're going to eliminate poverty on a global scale. We are just going to, we're going to nail this. Like, how are we going to do this? Maybe it's business acumen. Maybe it's like, okay, we are just going to pool as much money together as humanly possible. Like, we're going to venture capital the gospel into our lives. Like, maybe that's it. Maybe it's a charismatic leader. Like, we are just going to find the best people. And this screen is so good. We can just show you the best teaching everywhere, any week. You don't have to worry about it anymore. We can just phone it in from our standpoint because we got the best YouTube teaching ever, and we're just going to put it to you. Maybe it's great displays of talent. We're just going to put the most talented people up there in Jesus swag. That's what we're going to... Can you imagine if Taylor Swift <laughs> was wearing WWJD? <laughs> it would be just like that time at Coachella that Justin Bieber made everybody sing Oceans. Like, it's going to... That happened. Uh, it's just going to be exactly like that or that time that Kanye made Jesus as king and <laughs> we don't talk about Kanye. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> You are sensing my sarcasm. I understand. Here's the second teaching. It's servanthood. It's servanthood. Two verses I want to show you. The first is this. This is Jesus talking again. Jesus called them together and he said, You know the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. I love this verse. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be the first must be your slave. Again, in Matthew 23, he says this, the greatest among you must be a servant. In the Greek, there's not a word for slave and servant. It's the same one. So we just kind of translate it to make it more palatable. But it's a slave. These two ideas are not working against each other. You will do greater things than Jesus. And you will serve everybody. Those two are working side by side, not against each other. God is very clear. Overcoming the world is his job. My job is to serve. I learned this in high school. There was a, my youth minister was awesome. I loved working... Um, middle school camp. I loved going to middle school camp when I was a middle schooler, and then as I got a little bit older, I just wanted to help anywhere I could. So when I was a freshman in high school, he needed dishwashers. <laughs> and in Jesus' name, I washed dishes. It was like me and four buddies. It's the closest I've ever been to being on a pirate ship. It's like <laughs> there is a storm coming because they had ketchup and syrup today. And it's coming to you, 120 kids. And we got to get these clean before lunch, baby. Here we go. Steam billowing. An old, ratty swim towel over your shoulders. And you are going. And it was nice. It was fine. It was kind of fun. But then I got to be 16. I had my license. I had all the wisdom in the world. <laughs> and I was asked to wash dishes again. <laughs> I'm like, why am I still clean? Now it's fine. I was like, all right, good. That's fine. That's fine. But then, the guitarist for that week got sick and he had to drop out. And I'm going to Jamie, because I'm my youth minister, because I am leading worship at our youth group, and I'm like, Jamie, this is my passion. Jamie, this is my gift. This is where I'm going to make it happen. Listen, Mordecai told Esther, for such a time as this, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm really laying it on thick. And I can tell he's actually getting mad at me, because now as a youth minister, I'm like, you know how much stuff you have to do at camp? And then there's a 16-year-old that's like, let me play guitar. Like, that <laughs> had to be annoying. <laughs> but he looked at me, he's like, you are making this week happen in the kitchen. I need you there. I did not like that answer. When I got to be 18 and I graduated, he was like, okay, you've graduated. You can be a counselor now. He never had to micromanage me. He never had to worry about why I was there because I was there when I was washing dishes for three years. And it, it had a whole new perspective because I saw what went into camp, that there was no job that was below you. 
And it's so interesting now because I have carried this rule over as now I am leading weeks of middle school camp and I am frustrating high school kids. I love it. <laughs> but I have, a kid, I have like one or two kids right now for sure that they have washed dishes two years in a row and if they were to ask like, hey, when I graduate this year, can I help? I'd be like, absolutely. Because I've seen you do it. I've seen you work. I've seen you get up at like 6.30 when you had to stay up to help with campfire. I've seen you do it all. Now there are... Students at times that are like, oh, is that the rule? I'll wait till I graduate to serve. I got it. It's like, eh, maybe not, man. Maybe not. I'm sorry. Here's the thing. Like, if, if you are going to, I don't know if I want you to mentor a student unless you can prove to me that you're willing to wash feet, dishes. Sorry, wash, <laughs> wash. I don't know where I would get wash feet. I don't know. Jesus demonstrates this very leadership over and over. When he says it will not be the same power dynamics, he's pointing to himself as the alternative. You cannot shape the world for Jesus unless you're living like him. But here's the speed bump, okay? Let's summarize what we've talked about before we get to this last pair. It's your purpose to know God and restore the world to know God. And when we serve in God's name... We live out that purpose. Here's a speed bump. If this was easy and obvious, you'd be doing it already. If this was easy and obvious, everybody would do this. It's clearly not. It's clearly difficult because it does not come naturally. There is no media you will see that tells you this is the best way to go. There is nothing on Facebook or commercials or TikTok or LinkedIn or billboards or magazines in your workplace, at your school, in your sibling life, whatever it might be, there is nothing that is going to say like, yeah, 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 serve everybody and you'll live out your purpose. That's the way God designed you. This is not floating downstream. This is swimming against the current. And so you can know what your purpose in life is, but if we just get this on like a cerebral level and not in our gut, like day in, day out, it's not going to take. And so if you're like frustrated by this, we're going to finish up with like two, two prayers here. In this exact same passage where he says, you will do even greater things than I, Jesus says this, yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. I cannot think of anything more in Jesus' name to pray than would you make my heart like yours? Now, again, back to my kids learning to talk. What, learning, like a kid learning to talk is weird, right? Like, first off, you realize how you talk while you're talking to them. You're like, wait, how do I make that sound with my mouth? Like, you just don't think about it. And so you want your kid to talk because like crying is not great. So you're trying to figure out how to get them to like talk. And there's certain ways you teach a kid to talk and there's certain ways you do not get a kid to talk. With Zoya, we have not taught her grammar. She's two and a half. Like you don't look at a kid and go like, honey, you need to use an article like the or an. Sweetie, we need to start putting our verbs in past tense. You are no longer at daycare. You were at daycare. Where does the conjunction go? Some of you guys are like, where does the conjunction go? <laughs> Here's how you teach a kid to, to talk to you. Repeat after me. That's it. Say da-da. If you struggle to pray, speak God's words back to him. Repeat after me. If you want to learn the language of prayer, if you want to know what to say to God, repeat after me. Hey, can you, can you say, so here are two verses I want to challenge you to turn into a prayer this week. Here are two verses that if you're like, this sounds kind of daunting. Here they are, and I love these verses. The first is this, Philippians 2.13. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. 
Did you, did you catch that? God knows that you have to swim upstream to live out your purpose to the point where he's like, yes, it takes a divine intervention to get me to want to do this. So what is this like as a prayer? God, you are working in me and giving me the desire. God, you are giving me the desire and the power to do what pleases you. That verse is not a request. That's a statement. What would it be like if you just made that statement to God once a day, same spot every day? God, you are giving me the desire and the power to do what pleases you. The second verse is this, 2 Thessalonians 1.11. This is to a church that Paul just absolutely adored. He loved this church, and when he talks about them, his prayers for them are so cool. He says, so we keep praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call, and may he give you the power to accomplish the good things your faith prompts you to do. God, enable me to live a life worthy of your call. God, enable me, make it possible, and give me the power to accomplish all the good things you are prompting me to do. God, when I feel you prompt me, don't let me just walk away from it. God, when I feel my faith prompting me to take a next step, have a conversation, make a prayer, sacrifice time, cut things short with other people to be there with people who need me, give me the power to do this. Next week is all about that prompt, how you respond to it. But here's what I want us to do as we're kind of wrapping up this week. I, I, I know I joked about Justin Bieber. His heart's in a good place. But here's what I really mean by that. One of the things that is a pet peeve in church, and I know I work at one, but one of my things that is a pet peeve that happens at like conferences or teachings and things is we talk about society or the world. And it's such a cop out because the world does not have a face. It's easy to say, like, I'm going to go do something in the world because you didn't name anybody. The world God is calling us to has faces, names, personality. And, like, I know I'm on stage right now, but God does not do his best work up here. He does his best work on front porches and over coffee tables. And so as we're saying, like, God is calling you to restore the world... Who's your world? Who's your world? Is it your family? God is calling you to restore that because he knows it's possible. Is it your workplace? Because God has blessed you, you will bless that place. Is it your friends? Is it your group text? Because you know Jesus, they can know him too. So I want you to make a list this week. And in fact, if you need to pull out your reminders app right now and set a like daily reminder at 7 p.m., at 8 p.m., at noon, whatever time this is going to go off that you're going to be like, I will do this. I need you to come back and basically be able to look at Monday, here's who I talked to. Tuesday, here's who I talked to. Because here's the deal. You might not even realize who's in your world and just slowing down is going to be a prayer time where God says, they show up in your life every day. You talk to them every day. About very stupid stuff, but you talk to them every day. And I need you to bring that list back because we're gonna, we're gonna do some stuff with it, okay? Who's in your world? You're probably not gonna reach the whole world, but you're gonna change someone's world. Whose is it? And so this week, this is our prayer. God, show me your heart. Show me your world. And God, would you give me a vision of what it looks like for that world to be restored? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. You give us purpose. You give us meaning. We don't have to figure it out. And God, it's not even that hard. And we know we can do it because you have done it. And God, you've said we can do it. If you can say, let there be light, and it just shows up, then when you say we can do something, we can trust it. 
you make this possible, God, because you went to the cross. It wasn't enough just to save us. You wanted us to join you in the work. It's a beautiful thing, God. As we come to this time, God, would you bring to mind the people that you're calling us to? It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I would invite you all to stand and worship with us for this last song.
We can clap because the Lord is good. Amen. 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 Let's not be afraid to give God the glory and honor that he is due. Luke said, who is in your world? I think it's safe to say that all of us are in here today because we were a part of someone's world and they invited us to church. Or maybe you're like me and your parents made you go to church. But that's okay. Regardless, we're still here because someone uh, prayed for us. Someone said, I want to tell you about Jesus. So this week, we really want you to figure out who is in your world. Make a list and bring that back next week so we can instruct us on how we can uh, better reach the people in our world. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm glad to see you all today. Take care, and we'll see you next week.